<laughs> so, we are going to have a look at aerobatics, but more towards the end, because the more important thing to be aware of before aerobatics is the flight envelope, and uh, where you may be exceeding the loads of the aircraft. So, uh, there's a drawing that we produce, which is uh, called the flight envelope. And it's a mixture of, uh, I don't know, the laws of physics and... Uh, the laws specified by the governing bodies that certify aircraft and tell the manufacturers what they've got to do. So it's fundamentally a graph of G loading. Well, this one works, but it doesn't And speed. So G loading and speed. So the first thing we look at is uh, the stall speed of the aircraft at various. Uh, speed it will stall at. So at uh, 1G, yeah, it will most aircraft will stall, and let's say Tucker K21 varies depending on the pilot, which is another element of which I'll come to in a second. Uh, it will stall at the vaguely 36, 37 knots, so VS if you like, V stall. Uh, and at uh, zero G, it will stall at zero knots. So what we're looking at is drawing a curve. Starting like so. So you're flying along with your K21 near the stall, and the only symptom of a stall that's really alive, and I do it all the time, if I pull the stick back, nothing else, I can't raise the nose. If I can't increase the angle of attack, I can't increase the G load in the glider, so I'm at the stall. Now, if I speed the glider up, and then I decide to uh, pull the stick back, I can generate more G. And as I generate more G, I'll increase the weight of glider, and it will reach it will stall at a higher speed. So we have an ever increasing stall speed to the uh, compared to the uh, the G it can pull, and we end up with this curve like so. <coughs> so if you're flying along at uh, 100 knots and you pull the stick back, you can pull a hell of a lot of G. So basically, the faster you find, the more G you can pull. Right, so that is the law, that's the laws of physics. So this line, this boundary of our envelope, flight envelope, is uh, governed by Jesus, if you like, if you like to it. And, <laughs> and flight below this speed is sort of not possible. In fact, you can't fly below the stall speed of the glider. <coughs> right. So then uh, we've got uh, the designers of the aircraft have stipulations they have to reach by the governing bodies and the JAR 22 is one of the list of uh, numbers that the manufacturers have to adhere to for uh, designing the aircraft to get it certified. And for uh, we can talk about two sorts of aircraft, we can talk about utility and uh, unlimited. And this is aerobatics really. Uh, the uh, jar requirements for a un uh, utility aircraft are uh, it's, no, it shall not. Uh, you must be able to pull 5.3 g, okay. And if you uh, are going at VNE, you at uh, well design speed actually will go VD. Oh, I've got some differences there. We'll come to in a minute, and uh, that will descend down to 4 g. Right, so, one, two, three, four, five, listen, you can't go there. Now that, you can depart beyond that line, you can produce flight beyond that line, if you're exceeding the G limits of the aircraft, you're going outside the design criteria. criteria. <coughs> so, this is uh, the beginning of our drawing. Then we're going to look at the maximum speed of the aircraft because then the manufacturers have another limit the 4G which they will be the, the design speed the maximum design speed of the aircraft and at that they can only pull 4G and it is a descending uh, G level between the two um, but the VD isn't the number that you'll see written on your chart well you'll see written on your chart this is VNE velocity never exceed um, velocity delivery speed has to be within 10% of VD. So desire is to go 10% faster, so you'll have V and E. And uh, the F, V and F, V and F. And 
in between that, you'll have a uh, flow design for the speed flow. Now, i.e., the test pilot will fly it within 5% of VD, and that one there is the uh, design speed flow. That's what your test pilot will do, or the guy will do once they produce the aircraft and they do test flights before certification. That's the speed he'll fly to. <coughs> so, you're actually, you've got a four, you've got the 4G plus a tidy bit there, in effect. So, that is the envelope to which you must adhere. Right. <coughs> um, you may, um, by the K21, for instance, if you look in the placard, what you'll see is VNE. You never, you'll never really see what the design speed is. You'll never see what the design flame speed is. You'll basically see the uh, manufactured VNE. Um, and for all this, <coughs> fundamentally, you need to look at if you're going to start doing aerobatics or just interested in what the limits are of your own glider. You're going to, you can draw your own one of these from your uh, um, own sort of uh, flight manual. So. We said that was uh, 5G or 5.3. This speed it gives me here is what we call DA. Because if you look at what we've got here, if I fly at this speed and I pull full back on the stick at 5.3G, uh, the glider will stall. In other words, it's physically impossible to actually exceed 5.3G by the input of the uh, elevator. Uh, which is another important issue with this. If you uh, think of VA, max manoeuvring, we call that. Yeah, VA max manoeuvring. Uh, that refers to the loads induced on the aircraft by the elevator, nothing else. So basically, what it's saying is VA, I can use full elevator, but I can't use any other control. So perhaps I could use half and half of two controls, or a third and third, third and three controls. Uh, the most load is induced by the elevator, so by using half and half with, say, aileron rudder, we'll induce less loads than actually one input of full elevator. So, max manoeuvring, and that's why it says, it states that uh, VA is the use of one control reflection max. Or half and half or third and third. Uh, so there gives you your fundamental one. Now you've got the inverted, uh, so you can fly upside down, K21, which is a good training aircraft for uh, um, aerobatics. It doesn't have a symmetrical wing, so it won't uh, stall at the same speed. You're going to have it will stall at a higher speed. It's much in more inefficient wing, it'll reach its stall speed at a higher number. I've no idea what the true number is. Unless you've got feet or extension on it. Uh, well. What's another thing I'll come to in a minute? Positional errors. So it will end up with an asymmetric looking drawing which will look something like this. Lower numbers. And those design numbers are minus 2.65. This is for JAR, by the way, not, not for a K21. And I'll do that a bit steeper. And a minus 1.5, I think. So that's what the glider must have to adhere to to get its certification to be able to, be able to sell it on the market. <coughs> um, the uh, VA, by the way, you can calculate once you know this speed here. This is a this is a square curve. Basically, what you're saying is that uh, uh, VA equals V stall times the square root of G. Basically, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. <coughs> so VA is a, is a given once you know your stall speed and the G limit that you're going to adhere to. I'll take that. Maybe complicates things a bit. But it's, it's, it's all just linked to that. That's not, it's not arbitrary where that number comes from. <coughs> right. Now that's all well and good until we start thinking about gusts. Okay. So, gust will impart a load. 
because of the instantaneous nature of a gust, basically it will not, if it was nice, smooth, slowly ramped up increase in airspeed, then the glider would stall at whatever speed it's appropriate for, for the G is pulling for the weight of the glider, etc. Uh, when you get a, what we call a knife edge gust, that literally is going from zero to, uh, in, the, in the case of a high speed gust, 15 meters per second. Um, that gust, as it arrives at the leading edge and increases the speed of the airflow over the glider, will actually induce far more lift than you would naturally expect it to be able to produce um, because it will stall at a higher speed. Um, and that will, they allow for 25% excess, excess loading due to gusts. So you have what we call a gust line. Uh, and if you start at one, the gust actually induced loads by the gust can be the straight line, like so. Uh, quite often, it will be very similar to the uh, VA, but it's not actually in, in a number of cases. And this load here occurs at this speed, which is called VB, and VB is rough air. Okay. And this slope is basically the load induced according to a 15 meter per second gust. And it's a knife edge gust, which is quite important, which is why it will uh, produce the load before the glide is stalled. But this is an extra load. This isn't, uh, I can't fly along here <coughs> at that speed, pull G, and, uh, and then come into a gust, because I will exceed the G limit. So that is purely an independently introduced load. So in rough air, if you, you can fly at, if you fly at VB, uh, <coughs> you will uh, be safe. You will not overload the glider should you hit this gust. And if, uh, if you fly in England, you may go, this feels a bit rough today. Uh, when you start venturing abroad and you start flying in the mountains and you start flying in the wave rotor from the mountains and you'll start to get a notion of what they're on about with knife edge gusts, they're incredibly violent and you start to think what is VB, it's not speed that we normally uh, need to worry about too much in this country um, but it's, uh, that's where VB comes from <coughs> now they must also the designers say, thou shalt not exceed, it must be uh, the loading, it must be able to withstand the loading of a seven and a half meter per second gust at VNE. <coughs> so one of the reasons, if it's a very thermic day, then we don't do aerobatics, for instance, because of the extra load induced, we may already be approaching these uh, areas. I mean, you'll by design be flying to pull three and a half G or even four G. Uh, so you've only got a small extra uh, amount of induced load from a gust to start exceeding the gust limits of the glider. So that's another consideration for aerobatics. <coughs> what else have we got? The ultimate failure load. Um, if I pull this amount of G, then uh, there should be no permanent deformation to the glider. It, everything should stay within this elastic limit. Uh, if you start pulling that level of G, then it's always worth getting somebody like Rogers to have a look at your glider. Um, because uh, you may actually have gone a bit beyond. And the glider will have an age, and you might be doing something cumulative from something that somebody else did, etc. etc. <coughs> so that you you want to, you're in the uh, realm here of uh, once in the glider uh, being given a once over. Uh, the ultimate failure, the glider must be able to withstand one and a half times that load. So I need my box. I'll get a new shoulder one day. I'm going to do one and a half times. Uh, this is uh, 1.5 times the G limit, uh, max G limit. And that is, uh, and it has to withstand that for three seconds. And if 
but uh, so I'm not too sure how they test that. I don't think they do. But uh, that's what the uh, R22. That is what the guys have to design their aircraft to. <coughs> so they've got a maximum operational G limit, if you like, where nothing should permanently deform, and a maximum and ultimate limit at which it must stand for three seconds before something breaks off. Is, is that a material and construction technique independent thing? Or is that, because like normally when you apply safety margins on stuff like that, it quite often depends on your material and your method of assembly and construction, you know, yeah. like if, whether it's welded metal or composite layer or stuff like that, or... Yeah, go, go above my pay grade. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, all I know is that that's, that is the number they have to be able to prove. And they'll, they'll do, they will do destruction tests of wings. I don't know if you've seen pictures of wings in jigs. Pretty impressive. There's a picture of a Vega, uh, where they've got the Vega in uh, the jig, and they bring the wings up. Oh, I'm not kidding you, they're down near touching at the top. Bloody extraordinary. That was when it was new, by the way. There I was. You've got to add There I was asking Roger if I could do loops in the Vega. He said no. Well, no, he said good enough. That's the pocket, not I know I'm not the <laughs> Usually the, uh, the when a uh, so we'll be looking at air brakes because when you're talking about doing loops and stuff and <coughs> max speeds for things, uh, there's no mention here of air brakes and the effect of air brakes. Um, I've never seen a operational speed less than VNE for when you can actually use air brakes. So you can open air brakes in most gliders to check your own uh, manual. Uh, up to V and E. However, what changes now is the load distribution over the wing. You're destroying the lift ca producing capability by quite a big margin for an area, probably about almost twice the size of the, the paddle, distance-wise. And if you're generating uh, uh, all that lift, all that lift is now going to be generated by the tip portion and the root portion. Um, and you will reduce the uh, maximum load limit uh, to 3G. On, a, on something that's designed to 5.3. So with your air brakes fully open, for instance, if you have this notion that you're in a dive and you're concerned about the excess speed build-up and you decide, oh, I'm going to open my brakes now, uh, that'll reduce the speed, but whatever, no, I'll pull out. Uh, you'd be much better just not opening the air brakes and just pulling out. The, um, you don't want to exceed the meaning, and we'll come to that in a minute, because the design, or the... Uh, Failure mode is slightly different. You can ever can envisage G loads. I think you've loaded some of the bends and it breaks. Uh, flutter is slightly different. Um, although it is a load induce uh, that will break the glider, it isn't produced in quite the same uh, intuitive way that you can think of when you just increase the way you're bending something. The uh, <coughs> so you don't want to go through VNE ever. That's what it says. VNE means what it says. And as the glider gets older, then the uh, control surfaces, the junctures of the control surfaces may get a little sloppier. <coughs> the, uh, um, your glide, your um, ailerons may no longer be in the same mass balance that they occur when they left the factory. I mean, quite often, I know Roger will probably weigh an aileron before he even starts repairing it, because he will probably realise that the damn thing was out of spec before he started. So the odds of him being able to repair this and put it in spec are pretty much zero. Which is why quite often you get uh, breakages of things like ailerons, you buy a new one because the repair on this is incredibly difficult and quite often not feasible. Uh, gel coats will take on moisture. That can change the C of G because a lot of the aileron is behind, and nearly all of it's behind the actual pivot point. So as you change the C of G, you will change the uh, it's um, incl inclination to flutter. It will be flutter more readily. Okay. So, back to air brakes. Close your air brakes. Pull out the dive. Uh, don't pull out the air brakes. So. <coughs> the um, you find things that are uh, cleared for cloud climbing, for instance. Basically, things that are clear for glide climbing are usually gliders that have, well, they are, they're gliders that have a speed limiting brakes that will speed limit them at 45 degree dive. Okay? 
Uh, early gliders, and there are some about, and I think the Vega might be one of them with the trailing edge brakes. It probably has speed limiting brakes. So Skylark. Sky yeah. Sky if the tips don't Sky. bend under <laughs> too much before we get there. Uh, so something you get, that, that means you can put it in a vertical dive, and with the air brakes open, you will not exceed VNE. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, most gliders, certainly glass, if they're clear for cloud climbing, means that in a 45 degree dive, the air brakes will keep them below VNE. They have to uh, to get your certification. They have to, I think, 30 degrees for things like duos and whatever. They have to be speed limited at 30 degrees. Uh, but that doesn't clear them for cloud climbing. So you'll find that things like the duos and whatever you want clear for cloud climbing. <coughs> so, uh, we can have a look at this end now. Flutter. And what flutter is? What, uh, what you're going to find is that as you go faster uh, and you naturally come across some disturbance in the airflow, you will get flutter. So just picture yourself with a wing, for instance. Okay, and here's my aileron. And say so it's pivoted here. And say so my aileron might look like this. Pivoted there. If centre of gravity is, uh, well, I can't imagine it being in front. You take a rudder off, and a rudder's got a bloody great lead weight on it here. We used to have a K13 which had a mass balance here, a big bob weight, to bring the centre of gravity well forward. Um, so what is going to happen if your centre of gravity has is, is, uh, got rearwards? Maybe the centre of gravity is on. So our wing hits a gust, like so. <coughs> this, uh, so it's our knife edge gust, pushes the wing up. Because the C of G of this aileron is behind, it will the inertia of the aileron will cause the aileron to lag behind the wing. This under canvas the wing, generating more lift. And off we go. Then we reach the end of the elastic limit, not limit, but the elastic sort of deformation of the glider. Well, and the wing then decides to, in terms of like that, decides to then bend down. So then it gets downwards. And then the aileron gets left slightly behind, like so. Under camber in the wing, increasing more the downward force on the wing and at a certain speed uh, and certain magnitude of disturbance <coughs> then you will find yourself with a uh, divergent oscillation <coughs> that is what flutter is well that's one sort of flutter not good another sort of flutter which is significantly more serious is torsional flutter i'll show you an interesting video of flutter in a minute Torsional flutter, so say that's your root section, and uh, here's your tip section. This doesn't look anything like it, does it? Now, as you speed up and hit a uh, gust, um, the, the root will be largely unaffected by the gust, but the tip will twist as it generates more lift, and you will end up with the tip like so. <coughs> and then it reaches the top of its bounce, and starts to bounce back down. And the opposite can happen. If you get torsional flutter, as Simon tells me, that will rip your wing off, or the end, end part of your wing off, in no time at all. Instead of, uh, you can get a, uh, <coughs> the aileron flutter, which will make some interesting shapes in the wing, which we'll get, and that will, uh, and you'll hear that and see that, I think, Matt, you were flying with somebody who got flutter when you were doing aerobatics with some mad check. Yeah, it wasn't. You seem too worried. <laughs> this sort of flutter you would have been worried about. This is torsional flutter because that's very short lived, a few oscillations, and the, the wing breaks off, or the back at the end of the wing breaks off. Uh, I'm just going to show you a video of flutter. Now this glider is uh, Ackerflieg, which is a group of students, German students, who get to design all sorts of stuff in their aerodynamics uh, courses, build gliders, do stuff with gliders, and uh, 
Okay. It might be a computer gun. So if it's gone off, yeah, gone to sleep. Wake up. Yep. Can you see that? Can you see it now? <coughs> One. So this glider, I think what they did was remove aileron balance, either remove or reduce aileron balance, and they're flying at relatively normal speed. I think they're flying at about 60 odd knots, apparently. Not that one, that one, I think. Can you make screen that? Oh, I've never seen that, I've never seen that. This is the, Liz used this one, didn't she, in her lecture? Some little bits. <coughs> oh, look at that noise. Look at it go. <laughs> doesn't it think it's solid, does it? No, it doesn't. So that is funny. Notice how the tail <coughs> is uh, going yeah, as well. The fuselage is uh, fluttering as well. It ought to be the, the fin. There you go. <laughs> a Mexican wave in a glider. <laughs> so that is, uh, you can either get the rattling of the uh, A-rongs, uh, or you can get the whole wing going like this. Or if you're really unlucky, then you can get yourself a uh, torsional flutter. So that is flutter. <laughs> I've never heard of portion before. Did, did it actually occur in gliders? Uh, I've never heard of oh, this is just a, through a conversation I had with Simon, so it's not actually anything I've read about. Mm. So I was, uh, I've never heard of a wing sort of disrupting like that. I haven't until I had the conversation with Simon, so I thought I'd throw it in. I was going to do a little bit on aerobatics now, which is the fun bit, really. So you can draw this for your own glider. When you fly a fully aerobatic glider, for instance, then you'll find that the G limits, well, the use for the, the required G limits are plus seven, plus five, but uh, B and E and... Uh, and plus seven, plus seven, and minus five, minus five. Uh, that's for um, non-utility, as in aerobatic gliders. And then you'll get gliders that are designed to even high levels than that. Can I just go back to your um, diagram you just wiped off? So you don't need the diagram. Um, are there any um, things to be aware of in flux gliders compared to other gliders? In yes. Context? Uh, I'm not sure about the flutter side of things, but certainly the um, the gust uh, lines are different with the flat gliders. Also, um, if you go back to this is the weight of the the, the, uh, the people in the glider. <coughs> well, if that's my basic drawing, right? this uh, gust limit is done on maximum loading of the glider. Uh, <coughs> If you think about it, uh, if that's your stall speed, uh, max all at weight, your stall speed when you go solo in your K21 is going to be less. So which is going to, uh, say 1G, but it'll be down here. So in fact, you end up like so. <coughs> so your, your envelope will ultimately just become a bit wider, uh, or larger. Well, no, your ability to pull more G really, uh, for the same uh, type of input to the elevator will actually produce more G. Yeah, so, so, so that um, the downward line would be higher than the one. Uh, well, this is unaltered. This is, this, is the, this is your limit here. Uh, but uh, you're actually more easily able to pull that G. This is an extreme sort of thing, but it's... Uh, we are talking about the limits. Yeah. It is counterintuitive, isn't it? So mm. you think if it was lighter, you would, you would 
if it's heavy, yeah. you install at a lower speed. Oh, no, no, that's, that's yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Speed. yeah. yeah but, but I mean, you but think you'd go with lighter, though. You, you would, in a glider, you would think it would be a higher stall speed if you were lighter than, than if you were heavy. But it's actually, counter, what I'm saying is counterintuitive. Well, just right. like me. Right, right. okay. Yeah. 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 No, I'd, I'd think the other way, personally. Yeah, yeah but you've got, you've got something else as well, which is when we talk about designing an aircraft that can pull 5.3G before you. Overstress yes. the airframe. Yeah. It's not actually 5.3 G that overstresses the airframe, it's a certain amount of newtons of force on the wing, and the G is worked backwards to that on the assumption that you fly on a max all that way. Uh, yes. So, so if you've you, got you, a lighter person. If your airframe's flying at a lighter all that way, so you're, uh, you can pull more G in, before you rip the wings off. Supported load is re reduced. <coughs> <clears throat> there you go. So, I think I'll fully answer that. Um, other, th other things that are uh, rather annoying, really, on the specifications for gliders, uh, max wind speed, for instance. Uh, the specification, JAR 22, is that uh, max wind speed must be at least uh, 59 knots. So they calculated to see whether at, uh, on a winch launch it will withstand uh, the loads on it at 59 knots. And if it does, they stop there, because they've complied. So you'll find 59 knots is a fairly common thing. Now we had the, the BGA who probably got involved in the calculations for changing the strop on a, uh, from a uh, black to a brown. <coughs> if you put... Um, a weaker link on, you can actually go and go up to 65 knots because the, the weak link, reduced weak link, gives you a, uh, a lower load failure. So you, but they won't uh, actually, um, don't necessarily have to tell you any more than 59 knots because for ages, Puchas, for instance, uh, <coughs> as, uh, and they still are, I think Puchas is still on 59, aren't they? I don't think, I think they are. Yeah. Even though they're. Uh... Aerobatic glider. Yeah. So, uh, but that, that's the reason you'll see that. It's not because necessarily the glider isn't strong enough to withstand high, it's because the, the manufacturers didn't want to get involved in all the maths that they would have to, and the time, and the uh, uh, product liability, possibly, of uh, calculating what is its maximum speed. I mean, um, uh, <coughs> so there you go. Well, the limitations. Yeah, you didn't quite get to the flaps. The flaps. Oh no, the flaps. The. Um, you just look that up. <laughs> the. Uh, you've got a difference. The stall speed scenario is different. Um, with the flaps, that changes your your stall line, and there's implications with that, but only at the actual limit. Um, and. Curious because I'm it's always makes me curious the uh, VNE reduction in the Ventus, <coughs> which is uh, quite surprising, really. That's at zero, the VNE is reduced, isn't it? So you go negative and you're to VNE, but if you go to zero and plus, <coughs> then your VNE is reduced. Yeah. So at zero, they've reduced the VNE, which I still can't get my head around. <laughs> right. Um, uh, even though I can say as you get higher, VNE reduces. Uh, the VNE stays the same, but your indicated airspeed yeah. doesn't change. As the air gets thinner, uh, the indicated airspeed, uh, for argument's sake, yeah, your VNE is. I've got the numbers here, I'll just get the numbers on the book. Put yes, some books down. Some books. The. Uh, Indicated airspeed, I didn't bring the pad, never mind. It's one and a half percent per thousand feet. Uh, <coughs> that is the, um, never mind, not being the indicated airspeed. And the difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed. As the air gets thinner, your stall speed will appear to be exactly the same. As the air gets thinner, uh, you need to fly faster through that air to generate the amount of lift and you will actually reach the stall angle attack at the same 
if you like, a amount of air arriving over the wing. But that is because the air is thinner, is going to be at a higher speed. And your indicated, uh, your, your indicated air speed uh, will be uh, out for one and a half percent per thousand feet. And I think at 36,000 feet, <laughs> uh, you have uh, reduced your VME by half. So if you happen to be lucky enough and get into a wave and get up to 36,000 feet, your VNE, which was, um, for argument's sake, 181, it becomes 90 with our money, with the thickness of a needle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thickness of the needle. <laughs> so uh, indicated airspeed becomes an issue at, uh, for flutter. Uh, it doesn't affect the rest of it. Uh, so, a flutter is a speed-related uh, mode of failure. <coughs> so, you can get into flutter quite early on. Well, you, you won't think it's early on, you'll think it's completely normal. But your true airspeed will be different. Your, in the, your airspeed will fundamentally be under reading. So, it's 36,000 feet also about half an atmosphere in terms of pressure, then, as well? Uh, well, 500 millibars. Yeah. That's 500 millibars. Yeah, that's not that, yeah well, that's yeah. half an atmosphere. It's exactly yeah. half an atmosphere, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, there's, there's, a there's a temperature effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, so... Speed... There's another thing that happens with a, uh, an ASI that you'll get a chart for, which is positional error. <coughs> and... Uh, in the K21, it's negligible all the way up to V&E. Um, but you can get a, they can if they, I think they'd have to just produce a different position for your bloody Peter, really, if you had significant uh, positional errors. <coughs> um, but as you fly a different angle of attack, for instance, then the, uh, the presentation of the nose to the airflow will be different. And that will give you noticeable variation, specifically when you're upside down. You're upside down in the K21, uh, the error is about 22 knots. So you will think you're flying along at uh, 40 knots, you'll need to see seven to fly at 40 knots, you'll need to see 62 knots on your ASI. So the stall speed upside down in the K21 is about 46, you're going to need to see 70 knots in round numbers. And that's the speed you'll be flying at if you don't have of them, which is a pitot extension. The pitot in the K21 lives in the nose, like so. There's a tube in there, and you slide this onto it, like that, so you get your pitot extension out here. It has to be out by 120 mil plus, I think. <coughs> and that means when you fly upside down, you're uh, Speed will read the right amount. So, some basic aerobatics. Now you know what your plane can and can't do. I always think there's three sorts of aerobatics, really. There's uh, compositional aerobatics, which is very precise, uh, fairly minimal time in change from one attitude to another. <clears throat> and relatively uncomfortable inside the aircraft. Uh, it's verging, verging on violence, but not quite. Uh, then there is the um, display aerobatics, uh, which will be much more flowing and be much more comfortable to fly. But you'll still try to fly a round loop, for instance. And then there's the sort of aerobatics you'll do because you're taking on Mabel up for her 85th birthday, and you do something comfortable, in which case you won't do a round loop, and you'll do things nice and smoothly, if she should even want to do one. She probably will at that age, she'll probably think, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> so, <coughs> That's the worst that can happen. I think JS, well, I remember flying with one chap, uh, he was a competition pilot, and he says the most G they pulled was like just transition from 45 degree of iron to straight. There's no, he said, snap like that. It's, 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 it's horrible, it's violent, but that would look great for the scorers. Uh, 
scorers are looking at uh, two <coughs> things, but mainly, apart from the fact you stay in your box, you actually produce the move that's concerned. But where they mark it is uh, a fuselage line, uh, ZLA, uh, axis four, Z axis. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, CGA, centre of gravity axis, centre of gravity line. Something like that, I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah. axis. So, what they're doing here is, for instance, if you're doing the stall turn, they want to see the fuselage vertical. When you go around the top, They'll track the C of G. They want to see, that fundamentally they want to see something that is uh, smooth and equal like that. And then on the down line, they will look at the fuselage line. Um, <coughs> so two ways of marking it. The, the, all the <coughs> figures um, were designed, and well, not so much designed. The notation was created by Mr. Oresti, who is a Spanish, which always strikes me as old Spanish. He was a Spanish um, um, Air Force guy, wasn't he? And uh, he decided to do the notation for the figures. I say odd being Spanish because you go to France and it's littered with airfields and they're just into flying completely. You go to Spain and it's not in the psyche at all. I think uh, <coughs> Franco probably banned private flying, so there's probably plenty going around for the, the forces and the like, but uh, not for the joke okay. company. Um, so, Mr. Oresti designed the notation for the figures, and also what they call the K factor. Uh, some move, uh, some uh, figures are uh, simple to fly, ostensibly. Uh, they'll get a low K number, some are very difficult to fly, they'll get a high K number. So they have a K factor, which is just a multiplying factor. And uh, <coughs> not this, I think they do it in modelling, I don't think they do it in this. What they do in modelling, I was just reading about, was uh, they have uh, five judges. They dismiss the highest score, the lowest score, and average the middle three. I don't know if they do that in, uh, in uh, aerobatics, uh, glider aerobatics. But anyway, that was just one way of uh, getting rid of anomalies. Uh, so you have a K factor, <coughs> and you need to know how they're doing it. So, for instance, you'll get, if you get a freestyle one, and... Uh, Simple things like a loop, for instance. Not actually quite a similar trend. So if you're deciding to fly a loop uh, and you've got some wind, wind is a major uh, buggeration with aerobatics. Now if you're going to fly a loop, if you you would choose to fly it into wind, uh, because that will, when you get to the this bit's easy, this bit here gets tricky. And you've got the wind helping you extend that, so it makes it easier to make that round. Now, if you do it the other way, that was that way, if you do it this way, when you get to this bit here, you're now trying to extend that to produce this with the wind against you, and uh, you'll pinch the loop, almost certainly. At an extremist, you can actually go like that. Why don't I go that way? That way. Like that. And you might even feel from the cockpit you've flown something sensibly round because of the sensations that you'll be. So, the direction you're going to fly it into wind uh, makes a uh, significant uh, effect on how your loop's going to perform. Then, entry speed. Then you'll look through the um, digest of maneuvers you can do with your particular aircraft, there'll be a whole host of different entry speeds. When you go flying with people like uh, Graham Saw, it's like 100 or 120. Yes, two numbers pretty much cover all your entry speeds. Uh, for loop and uh, whatever, you, you uh, don't enter at 100. So, to gain 100, if I'm going to do a 45 degree down line, I would, uh, when I get to 95, I'll start to pull through, and I'll have 100 by the time I'm finished. We'll have a look at how we, I should have got the triangle, should not we? We'll have a look at how you determine a 45 degree down line to start. <coughs> uh, it's all about where you look. Well, on your wing, out in front of, so you can see you're facing that way. I'll draw it so it looks to the right. You'll put a little gadget on here, which has a, 
<coughs> and you take that on. Uh, it's an exciting triangle. So when you're going vertically up, when you're going horizontally, the horizon looks like that. When you go in uh, up at 45, the horizon will look like that. And when you go vertically, the horizon looks like that. Uh, but you don't just stick it on because that's how it fits. Mm. What you do is, it's not quite designed like that, it's designed more like this. And then the bracket. You just need to bend that bit. Because if you just align it with the fuselage axis, uh, that isn't zero lift. Uh, if you want, there it is, the triangle with the said little bit there. So you, that fits as it does onto the leading edge. And then what I need to do is determine what my zero lift angle is. Because if I'm going to fly vertically up, I can't be generating any lift. If I'm generating lift, I'm going like that. Because that's the bottom of the glider. So I need zero lift. Uh, and if I have that, so it's just lined with the fuselage axis, I'll be generating probably about three or four degrees angle of attack. So I'll go up like that. I need to bend this. And you'll do that by experience, experience by flying and getting that water actually quite right. I need to <coughs> bend this so you'll land a little about. Take the next 4,000 foot air or two. Move to your bank account. What have you. So you need to actually get a notion of on your glider, how do I bend that sizing triangle so that I can have the zero lift? So that gives you an accurate way of determining 45. You find that nearly all aerobatics is really in part, or a big part, is where you look. So before you start, wings level, string straight. So the right before you start, and you'll start here at a fairly minimal speed because you want this to be you want the judges to see this line. You'll pitch over at uh, either a moderate rate, if you're doing it for your own comfort as well, or at a, a fairly high rate if you're doing it for competition. And when you pitch over, then it's the, you're looking down the wing to a triangle to stop it at 45. <coughs> and then you can still see the horizon for that. But then you look down and you find a point on the ground. I've got my 45 degree down line, I find a point on the ground and I carry on aiming for it. And that means I continue down my 45. As I pull through the bottom to this part, again I can see where my wings are up. So, I'm now going to try and fly this perfect circle. You're never going to see that question. You'll never arrive here. Because <laughs> <laughs> we invented something. <coughs> right. <coughs> so, if I arrive... <laughs> so I arrive here 100 knots. Now I'm going bloody fast. And I need that this pitching rate, or this radius, to be the same as the, the slope part. So I'm going to have to pull fairly sharp, and I'll be pulling probably 3.5 G at this point. Okay. And as the glider slows, you're going to have to, it's 100 knots, you're actually having to pull particularly hard on the elevator to produce, to produce that. <coughs> uh, then as the glider starts to slow, as it actually will do, I will need to apply more and more elevator. And until I get to the top, I still want to be, according to you, I'm still sitting in the seat, comfortably in the seat. I'm obviously light in the seat, but I'm definitely sitting in the seat there. <coughs> um, I will have the stick pretty close to the backstop at this point. And now the glider will start to accelerate as it comes over. As it starts to accelerate, the elevator is going to get more effective. If I don't relax the back pressure, I'm going to start doing this. So I need to be relaxing the back pressure. But it's not a lot, actually. It's probably uh, it's probably a quarter of its movement at the most. Uh, by the time I get here, I'm accelerating bloody fast. <coughs> so now I'm going to have to apply more and more elevator. To get round. And if I've got it right, I'll go bloop, as I go through my own week at the bottom <coughs> of the loop. The only way you're ever going to know whether you've flown a round loop is you have an observer on the ground. 
<laughs> so you say, I'm going to do something, I'm going to practice my loops, can you tell me what they look like? And hopefully on the radio, so you don't have to land. Having done four rubbish ones to get down and find out they were rubbish, you were doing this. Because your perception of what you're doing <coughs> can be very different to the actuality of what you're performing. And then add so. And if you've entered at the hundreds, you've lost energy through there, you'll probably be doing eighty. Yeah. If you exited the hundreds, you've got to be down here. You've got to be lower. You cannot be at the same height. Unless you've got a jet. So, those are the sort of things you need to think of with the loop. Um, usually, you're looking at uh, linking manoeuvres together. So then you go, well, perhaps that is a loop followed by a roll. <coughs> Entry speed for a roll will be 120. So I know that now I've got to either put the 45 degree downline in to get my 120, or I design it so I've got a manoeuvre I can do that I can do at 80. Or, and I need, in fact I need 90, but I can just slip that in by just diving a little and then just, uh, well, never notice. Because at the, you'll normally end up doing one manoeuvre with a turnaround manoeuvre at each end, otherwise you fly off. You'll, you've got a prescribed box to fly in. And so you've got this imaginary bit of box. You'll have a hard deck of whatever they say, 2,000 feet, 1,500 feet, whatever. And your manoeuvre will be in the middle, you come round into the end and say a good turnaround could be a Shondell. Although I don't think Shondell's actually a, on the list of aerobatic manoeuvres, is it? It isn't, but it does appear in yeah. events. Yeah. <coughs> and then you come to Shondell, because what you've got to do is go and do something that's what they call turnaround, because it turns the glide around and you end up flying that way through the box to do the next manoeuvre. You come to this end and you do another turn around, it could be a stall turn. <coughs> and back. So, you're always thinking of when you exit, what am I going to have to do to get the speed I want? <coughs> the 45 degree downline will be annotated on the box. So, if the exit speed there. Uh, <coughs> um, needed a 45 degree and then to get to the speed which you need to do the next manoeuvre it would be annotated on your manoeuvre chart that you're given at your schedule you get a, uh, a known and an unknown usually in aerobatics you'll go to your two to do two sorties the known one is you known it for a week beforehand something like that for the whole year for the whole year so you've got your, your known then and then you can practice it so you've got the schedule you can practice then you go to the event, and then uh, you get given one. <laughs> That's it, and now you've got to work out, okay, so how are you going to do this? And this when you see people doing their, their magic dance around the hangar, trying to visualise their way around <coughs> different manoeuvres. So, oh, it's really hot in here, isn't it? Is it just me? Oh, it's the double blazing. Oh. Now, come to... Uh, so you turn around and you do the look at Shondell and we look at uh, what's his name? A uh, stall turn, simple ones. And then, uh, right, so Shondell. Uh, it's, it's, it looks the simplest manoeuvre ever. It's absolutely simple. It's a little sod to fly well. <coughs> <coughs> so, basically, a uh, hundred is a good entry speed actually for Shondell. You can do them from 80, but what you're going to lose is this 45 degree up line. That is become, going to become very short at 80 knots. So 100 knots, you can actually do a decent 45 degree up line. So you climb in at 45. Climb at 45. And I won't say what speed, but whilst you've got plenty of energy, you then roll the glider 45 degrees. So the glider goes along. Climbs 45 and then rolls. I'm drawing this rubbish, I know. There we go. And what will happen when you roll here, you'll end up with the wings vertical. Okay. Uh, now, in a K21 or anything with dihedral, 
you don't want to be looking up at the upper wing trying to work out whether it's vertical or not because if it looks vertical then you're not vertical because you'll end up doing this business if you've got that wing like that then the other wing will be like that and you'll be actually be like that <coughs> so you've got to take that into account you want the plane of the glider to be vertical the idea of a chandelle is you go around the top 45 degree down line and exit on a reciprocal of the heading you went in and this is the difficult bit getting this down line on the reciprocal of the way you went in uh, you have to pull around this corner at the top if you don't pull that's all right i'll break the tips off it's too big but if you were to pull up and then roll 45 as you come round you'll probably come out and end up easily easily 45 degrees offline <coughs> and you think it felt right it, i'm sure that was good but why am i pointing the way i want to point you need to pull quite a lot to get around this corner to bring it to a point whereby you can straighten up into 45 degree line which is on this reciprocal and that is the bit that uh, everybody misses out and doesn't do enough of and that's when you know you've done a good one is when you come down and there's a road in the valley there which is quite good and you end up you're still pointing down parallel to that road uh, so a ostensibly incredibly simple maneuver mm. and it's a little salt to try right so again i'd enter at 100 because you've got that time there if you start entering at 80 or below you'll find that uh, it's all a bit rushed because you need to start turning and you will leave it too long and you'll do a sort of shondelly floppy stool turning thing it won't be anything that's one way of coming back along to back into your box to do whatever maneuvers <coughs> next another one which is a bit as simple as a fly is the stall turn uh still turn literally climb vertically and then i'll draw it sideways uh and then go like that and down so two tricky bits and the cheat the cheat <laughs> is i'm tempted from there i've entered from here okay and i'll come out that way um <clears throat> what you do is if you're going to sort of do that way around if you're going to go around to your right <coughs> you uh, as you're pulling up you roll right and then as you get to the vertical you put in rudder to straighten it up which means that i thought you put your hand up then you work it out so you uh, dive speed if you just pull up like so and you pull up vertically when you get to the top here your rudder is central which means you've got half the deflection of the rudder to use to flip the glider over and get around the top here so if you're going to go to the right if you roll to the right first if you just pulled up then you go off at an angle like that so if you went in roll first and pulled up you'd be going up at an angle like that so what you do is then you put left rudder in excuse me husband how yes. long nearly done Yeah. Okay. Alright, so I would go up a fuselage, but I'd go up like that, okay? So that, that wouldn't score me many points. But what the judges are looking for is the axis of the fuselage. <coughs> so if I put in left rudder, my glider pointing up like that, with some left rudder on, then I go up like that, with the fuselage pointing vertical. Now when I get to the top here, and this is a feel, really. <coughs> but you work it. You can okay. never work out whether you're asking a question, Darcy, or you're just <coughs> thinking that through. Well, I've got a question, Dave. At that yeah. point, when you're going up and you're moving up straight, yeah. you're not on an up one. So you haven't mind. They're measuring the axis of the fuselage. Oh. Bearing in mind that they're looking at it from there. Okay. Yeah. So, so they're. You're going up like that, but they're looking at it. They know yeah, you're doing so it. They can't if they see that you're doing that. 
It's just called a cheat. So if you do it so ridiculously that they can see it, then uh, you'll it's, be it's that's a real exaggeration. Yeah. Yeah. But when we get to the top, I've got some left elevator in, which means that I've got two thirds, three quarters of the elevator movement to pick me around the top. Rudder. Uh, sorry, yeah, rudder. Yeah, correct, rudder. <coughs> um, I've got to keep it vertical. Now as I'm, I'm going around the top here, <coughs> it's a, 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 a tiny moment in time that is the correct moment, and it's feel, <laughs> really is all I can say. <coughs> and you'll do a few. If you do it too quickly, when you put the rudder in to uh, put the glider over, so the glider is now starting to go like that, it will carry on going up. So you'll kick the rudder in, but you'll carry on going up sideways. You put the rudder in too soon, or you'll go kick the rudder in, and <coughs> not a lot happens because you've been going too slow. And the difference between the two is very small. <coughs> uh, then over you go. Now what you've got to do is stop it penduling. Penduling. You don't want to do any of that. So you a bit of fancy footwork. And try to stop it penduling. Penduling. Down there. And this will be fairly brief, the down line, because uh, <laughs> you're going to be accelerating like a big bag. Puchas, very aerobatic, VNE 109, 105, 109. Not a lot. You should be you're flying one, aren't you? Don't you fly one? It's not good. What is it? I don't brick one. <laughs> I didn't get that. It's either 105, 109, something. Not a lot. Did the wings fall off? I forget the rate of accelerate. This is sort of numbers that Simon always remembers, isn't he? When he does this, you can say, and you'll be accelerating at such and such. Ten meters a second. Five point eight one meters a second. Well, that's the force, but yeah, but I've got a bit of drag, haven't I? It's at my speed build-up is going to be a bit less than that. Yes, it'll be nine point eight one meters a second there, and be a bit less there, a bit less there, a bit less there. But anyway, my speed build-up is going to be pretty impressive. And out at the bottom to all the judges. So they'll be looking at the reason that that cheat, as they put it, works is because the marking criteria for this is the fuselage axis line. And the fact that it's actually going exaggeratedly up through the sky like that, I think if they could really see that, I'm pretty sure they'd mark you down because they go, no, he's overdone it. <laughs> they all know you're doing it. Uh, so there you go. C and G track down the top. Fuse large line down there. No penduluming. And watch out for your speed builder. And turned around. And now going through your box for your next maneuver. How does the penduluming happen? Uh, inertia. This, this fuse large is going shtum like. It's not just, it's not just going to stop, is it, when it gets vertical? It's going <laughs> to do what a pendulum do swing. And you can, you got a bit of rudder. Really, the rudder power will be quite minimal at that point initially. Which, um, but you've got a bit. Sorry, which axis is the aircraft pendulum? Uh, nose down with the wings outside like that, it will come down and try to do that and overshoot, if you like, the vertical down line. So do your yawing. yawing, then, yeah. That would be the correct term. Okay. So you need to have enough inertia to have the rudder reacting to stress knots? Well, it's going to happen, isn't it, really? It's going to try and pendulum, and you're going to have uh, very little speed here if you've done it at the right. If you've done it too early and you've got speed here, but it makes the rudder nicely effective, you would have gone up sideways for a time yeah. as you input the rudder to initiate that yeah. uh, turn over the top. What would be the entry speed for this maneuver, and then what would be the speed at which you would begin your turn? You ah, about. I can't answer the second. The second one is feel. <laughs> First one, it got to be a hundred knots at least. Got to be because this up line, it's a vertical up line. I think the second one. The, the, faster, the faster you do it, the, the bigger the vertical up line yeah. is, and the more the judges like I it. I like it, yeah. So in your experience, when have you done the, 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 when have you started the turn on? 
Yeah, no, I don't know. Just, just, just I, I you don't. Okay. No, I couldn't answer that either. I don't think you really got time to look at the answer. Well, probably when it starts to go quiet. Yeah. Yes, it, yeah, it does rapidly. It's about that. It's, it's, it's feel, and it'll quiet, be different yeah. for different gliders because they'll make different noises. Okay. Are you going to be talking about um, what you do if you delay it too long? Tail slide. Mm -hmm. Tail slide. Uh, unless it is part of an air, if it's an accident, <coughs> uh, stick to the back corner and full rudder one way or the other. So you hold the controls in full deflection. Back stick means that you'll flip <coughs> that way, which is far more comfortable than flipping that way. The up elevator will carve a path through the air like so. You're holding the other controls full deflection because if everything was absolutely perfect and you're really, really, really good and really strong, you might be able to hold them central. But no. Because <laughs> if you can't hold them central and the wing slaps them over as the rearward speed increases, you've chance to break. Oh, K13, you wouldn't break something off. A number of gliders, you would actually break a control surface off. So, so you hold them fully deflected, so they're fully against the stops. So is that with any manoeuvre, if it's going wrong? For a tail slide, yes. Yeah. The tail slide is actually a manoeuvre. <coughs> then you're designing the outcome. <laughs> so that's different. It is quite exciting. Yeah, I've not done one. <laughs> I don't want to do one. I've not you, done one. Doesn't matter. You do, all you're doing is holding it against the stop, uh, to so it doesn't slam against the stop. Back stick is the, the only direction I would choose would be back stick because that would give me a more comfortable exit from the tail slide. It would be bottom fuselage down, bottom fuselage down, rather than canopy down, which would be less comfortable. It would be alarming stick, enough as it is. Back stick is over the pole. Yeah, everything at full deflection. But the, I would choose back stick, right? You could go forward stick if you wanted, but that would, if it's an absolute vertical tail slide, that will, so you can be down, less comfy. Mm. I like sitting in my seat. You're on a dead opposite, so full left rudder. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But full deflection. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter where you put the controls, as long as they're at full deflection. I personally would choose back stick rather than forward stick. I'm sensing from Helen putting her head through the door. Right. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Well done. Well, Shank. So I think I'm supposed to do something with it. If we can uh, cut it on. Appreciation today. Yeah. Thank you.